So, good afternoon. I'm Brendan Roddy. So, what we're going to be talking about today is connecting creatives. And this is more of a personal narrative that I put into a little slideshow of where I've started, how I came to where I am now, and how things have changed. Um, and it more is related to, um, I wanted to make an authentic experience for students to connect with other creative people in an authentic way, a real world way, and something that would make sense and they can even sustain on their own afterwards. So um, what we're gonna do is talk about sharing our work in, in a digital space. So I'm, like I said, Brendan Roddy, Kenny Bunt, Maine. I'm a middle school art teacher. Uh, a little bit about me, I came from the Washington DC area where I taught right outside DC in Maryland in a, a high school for nine years. And I had to photograph all the artwork for the AP portfolio. I taught the AP 3D design portfolio. So part of photographing artwork was of my normal practice, and I had to teach kids first how to do that. Um, everything has to be done in a professional way. It's got to look good, and they have to submit. So one of the things that I've set up in the back of the room is a little uh, seamless board uh, that you can keep set up in the classroom. You can set up in any space. You see masking tape, a table space, and either a piece of math board or a piece of chipboard, and you just kind of bend the shape, tape it all down, and when you put the artwork on there, you get nice good studio finish, high quality imagery, and this was just photographed in that same way the piece in the back of the room is. Photographed in the same way, the board is just bent so it's nice and seamless, and the kids are able to do this on their iPhone. These were all taken with an iPhone, so, a book sculpture, it's one of the assignments that we did. Thank you. And this um, is your students' work. This is both students' work, correct. So these were seniors in high school that have gone on. Uh, actually, neither one is studying art, which I'm disappointed by, but they both are able to take these kind of photographs, and I could leave this set up in our space. So I would photograph completed artwork in a really polished way, but it was also important for me to share the process, and that's where a lot of things that I'm doing now is about process. So, I gave a really easy way to photograph inside the studio, which is doing that seamless gray board. When you crop and edit everything, this was all cropped and edited on a cell phone and submitted online just using Google Drive. And then the other one was taken with a cell phone as well, natural lighting. Uh, this is behind our school. There's a little creek where when it rained hard enough, the runoff would all work. So we took their very simple studio piece, placing it in uh, an unnatural setting, or this is actually a natural setting, but putting it not in a studio setting, gave it a nice completed, finished, purposeful feel. And it's working with the students and showing them how to do that. So if they do decide to share these in a professional way, they get a lot more response and a lot more authentic experience. Is that metal? These are, this is clay. So different types of um, underglaze and glazes with just a white clay body. And this is a, an altered book. Yeah. So one of the things that I want students to understand is you don't have to be a professional photographer in a professional setting to get a professional quality look to an image. Hi, come on in. Sorry, Mike. No, you're fine. Brendan, is there something to that kind of uh, uh, parabolic shape of that? Is that like, important? Yeah, so when you look at a lot of three-dimensional artwork, especially pottery and sculpture that's photographed, they try to make a seamless setting so you get the, the illusion that it's just a very simple setting in a simple space. So if it's in the corner of a room, if it's with a lot of things that are distracting the background, it can actually take away from the artwork and the skill that's been used uh, to create it. So what I try to do is eliminate that by putting just a very basic gray background that anything from a light white piece to a dark piece could be photographed on. And then when you do um, any kind of photoshopping if needed or photo editing, it um, gives you kind of a medium tone to work with. Yeah, right. Um, so if you ever look at glass work or ceramic work when it's done by a professional artist, mm -hmm. they normally will hire a, photo a photographer to do all this and take the photographs but we're yeah. teachers on a teacher budget. Yeah. Yeah. So this is how I kind of came up with the best way to do a DIY that's transportable 
collapsible, you can move things around, and you can even leave it set up like I have in the back corner of the room for students to do on their own. So at the end of today, I'm gonna to give you some time to do a little bit of investigation using your smart device, your cell phone, and photograph and see how it, how it comes out. Yeah. So the next thing that I really thought about, oh, that got a little blurry, is where do kids share online and where do artists share online? So a big thing that I've run into, especially with the middle school age and that adolescent age, is this idea that they're not good enough and they're self-conscious. They'll make art and not want anyone to see. They don't want me to look at it. I'll come over and they'll cover their drawings or they'll cover their work up. And I'm like, no, that's not what we're here for. We're here to experience each other's work. So I thought about, okay, kids share online all the time. They take the triple chin selfie. They do all those weird things where you know, they'll Snapchat things back and forth. So I thought, okay, where do kids share online and where can I connect with them in those spaces? So in your experience, where are kids going online? YouTube. YouTube. Where's another place? And we'll write them up as we go. We have YouTube. Where else? Instagram, Snapchat, uh, Twitter, maybe oh. a little lesser degree. Snapchat, Twitter. And there's a lot of chat things that they're going to yeah, and other places. Say again? Just even text text together. Together. Yes. And you know, when I did this conversation before, I got Facebook. And I'm gonna put it over here for a reason. <laughs> yeah, not really. That's a the old, 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 old bogey go there. Yeah. That's where your so, parents go. When I asked the kids where did they share online, they gave me a lot of these things. Snapchat was a big one. It's fast, it's instant, it's something I'm constantly on and constantly using and going back and forth. Instagram was another um, one that was more visually based. Mm -hmm. And our kids are very visual at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. And then I thought to myself, as an artist, in my professional practice, I use Instagram almost every day, if not two times a day when I'm creating work. And it's a way that I've connected with a lot of people in really great ways and people have found my work through Instagram. I do have a website, I do have a school website, I do have a gallery, but Instagram was where people found me most often. So I thought, all right, I need to make this authentic for students and authentic for, for their experience and to try to break that self-consciousness of don't show my work, it's not good enough, it's not professional, Giving the opportunity to photograph in a professional look was one way, but also to share their work in progress was the other way. Mm -hmm. So at my former school that I came from, we had set up social media with Facebook and Instagram. I came from a school system where the monitoring of this stuff was not. We were not very monitored. We weren't um, cautious with anything. Uh, the assumption was we were adults and we would share in a professional way. Um, our students were all over the age of 13, which in the U.S. is one of the things that I, we have to be conscious about. So if we were going to share students' images, all of them had to be over the age of 13. They had to give consent to our school. Um, but other than that, we pretty much could just create a page and the entire art department was part of the page. So here we've got just some screenshots of the Churchill High School Art Department's um, Facebook pages and how we used to use those. We would share things. Um, one of the teachers, Amy, was very um, proficient at using Facebook. She would do that a lot. But what we found was most of the people, as you notice in our, what does he even tell us? Our follow, our follow group was not very large and most of it was parents and grandparents. Mm -hmm. And then this one, we can see it's only about 79 for an entire high school that had 2,200 kids. It's not a good amount of people. We couldn't get the information out where the kids were picking up on it. So 
in this way, I was like, okay, these are developing, they're where kind of I see things going and, and changing. So another way that I started to think about using digital spaces in the classroom was I started a Pinterest page. Mm -hmm. And a lot of work teachers, mm -hmm. you would hear using Pinterest a lot. Mm -hmm. What this provided me the chance to do was I would create a board based on whatever unit we're working on. And from there, I could pin a bunch of stuff. And the kids could go in there, create their own account, use either their one-to-one -one device or their smart device. And I would say, all right, as long as you're being productive, I'm OK with you using your cell phone in class. And they would do their own researching, their own inspiration building. And um, I could also send inspiration back and forth to them. Never thinking about the communication part of it. Never worrying about if something was going to be shared that was inappropriate content. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't have it happen. It just was natural. The kids knew what to share, how not to share. It was kind of, I was working with 17, 18 year old kids that had been part of the digital, um, digital world for, for an amount of time now and have had learned what is good and what is not and how to use those things. So with this, I did a lot for brainstorming. What it gave me the opportunity to do was just provide feedback. So Pinterest was a great way for me to connect with students and share ideas without having to look up constantly, having to Google certain things, or create presentations where I'm only showing them three or four artists. It let them dive deeper into that and make it a lot more personal. So the Facebook page that we had was great, but only parents really saw it. The Instagram page started to get a little more traction, but this really took off when I was working with students because it gave them their own way of searching and they could get lost for about 15, 20 minutes into something of their own and then share it with me for feedback if they wanted to pursue a concept or idea. The cool thing about this also was they could click on an image and it would normally take them to where that image was posted or shared and a lot of times I had them connect with artists directly. So they could email an artist about their ideas. They could talk to them about how inspired they were by their work. So I found that a really great way to make it a real life experience for students. Then I moved. I came up to Maine. And there was a, a, a different outlook on what a digital space can and should be. I went from working with everyone over the age of 13 to now my students are 11 to 14, so it depends on what age I'm working with. And um, the Children's Online Privacy Act, uh, Protection Act of 1998, says that anyone under the age of 13 has to have explicit parent con uh, consent for any content that's shared online. And Pinterest requires you to make a profile. Facebook, you can get to, but it's very limited unless you have a Facebook profile. So with that, our school has changed its policy and they made me submit an application, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. But my school policy was a lot more stringent and strict. So this is where this whole concept of me presenting and sharing my experience came. Because as I lived through this with Nick, um, he was sharing this information with Mary Alice and the DigiSid family about how I had to convince our IT department that this is going to be OK. That Life will not end because a kid is on an Instagram page or on a Facebook page. So a lot of it was coaching back and forth and showing people that this is going to be a healthy way for kids to experience real life moments. So what I would love to do now is give you an opportunity to look at your own districts or your own region's websites and see if you can find any information about your school's online policy, unless you know it off the top of your head. And I would love to share out if that's possible. Okay, give me a moment. Sure. Uh, I can look it up specifically, um, but I'm just thinking back to conversation. <clears throat> it used to be like everything was on lockdown. Like you couldn't go to YouTube, you couldn't do anything. And I remember trying to make websites and having to like, do these workarounds because there was 
you could you just couldn't do you couldn't type in it would show blocked. Then they opened that up. Okay. Um, and I don't know that like I don't think we have anything saying you cannot have a an account like a, a Twitter or like teachers have Twitter, schools have Twitters. I don't think we have any rules around. And it, actually, we're struggling right now with rules around whose images are on there. We we do a media release. Everybody signs one at the start of the year, but there's still people who are very nervous about kids putting pictures going out, even sure. with the media release. Yeah. So it's not a done deal, right? And I remember trying to implement a Facebook page in grade eight. That the pushback I got more was from parents. They didn't want kids signing up. So I was always I, so then I went to Twitter and I would filter. I had like filter my class activities through me. Not expect, and it was really for other educators to see or other classrooms to see, not students online. Because I'm talking about elementary. Sure. Right. I'm talking about grade eight and below. Yeah. So, um, what it explicitly states, I could probably look that up. But just from my own experience, that was kind of the way we've gone. And yeah, it would, um, but some kids did. I had kids grade five, six who had Facebook pages. Sure. By the time they reached me. Now, Facebook also kind of went blunt, like that's where your parents go. Yeah. They wouldn't have been on Twitter. Everyone, I did an Instagram page so we would put up art, artsy photographs kind of thing. We'd, sure. take a, we'd take a picture and go on my class Instagram. And that was tricky because all the kids in grade 7 and 8 were on Instagram. And I don't want to, but they'd want to follow my class account. I don't want to follow them. I don't want other people to find them. So trying to restrict restrict that it was it's, it's nearly it's very difficult I didn't have any push, pushback on that though okay. but parents would want to follow it and you're like ah but then they're one degree removed you know what I mean like what you're one yeah. degree and I can't police all that so so I'm glad instead of looking up the, the perfect legalese yeah I mean we can all read those things and half of it makes sense I mean, that's why it's written that way. Yeah. Is, you know, we have to absorb it and take it and it's probably take it a memo. In. Yeah. <laughs> so part of mine was, you know, and as educators are in the education system, acronyms are like everywhere. Mm -hmm. We had four different sets of four acronyms. So 16 letters in my brain trying to remember where it is and what it is and who I can share, what I can do. Um, the biggest thing that it all boiled down to. And for most people in most places, it's going to be communication. And that's what the problem was that I kept encountering. Can the kids email me or direct message me in this venue? If so, how can I block that? And if not, how can I make it as transparent as possible? Because that's where our parents got hung up, was we had, um, unfortunately, a teacher carry conversations with a student that were questionable out of context. And it was through a Facebook page and a text message. So that was where I was running into the roadblocks. So I had to make it explicitly clear and do a lot of that blocking, a lot of that, I can't, you can follow me, I cannot follow you. And I'll, and I'll show you how I got around all of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, all communication has to happen through our email service only. I was like, okay, I'll set it up. Next, I made it as open and transparent as possible. So my login and my password were given to our IT department. They can log in and check out everything that I've done. I shared it with our music teacher, our course teacher, and the other art teacher. So they, all, they can post as well. So it's more of a community, teacher community space. Um, I make it as transparent as possible. It, you know, we are professionals, and unfortunately there are people that um, kind of ruin it for the rest mm -hmm. by using it where they think is okay, but it's really not. So um, if I encounter those things, I make sure that I, I squash those mentalities the best I can. And then I prepare a stock statement on my phone that says, this account does not receive messages email brody at rsu21.net right off the bat. So if I do receive a message, which I haven't yet, but if I do, I've got a stop response that brings them back to my school account that's all monitored and taken care of. Because the biggest thing that I had to do with this situation was cover myself. 
-hmm. and, and show that this is a space that's a healthy place to share. Um, you guys wouldn't be here if that's not the mentality that you would have. But um, I also thought that this was a great chance for me to model what good online behavior looks like mm -hmm. and what healthy behavior looks like. And I equate it to like, we don't teach kids how to cook by burning them in the kitchen and then scaring them for the rest of the time. Mm -hmm. We teach them how to use the tools, how to make something great, and how to use it safely. Why do we not teach this the same way? This is what your work looks like online. This is what sharing with other artists looks like online. This is what it is in a healthy way. You know, and if we can prevent those burns, we're doing this right. So, um, if you ever want to, this has been shared. Uh, these are all hyperlinked. So if you want to go read all the details from my school system, if you just click the uh, RSU 21, it'll bring you all to it. Um, Digit Institute, that brings you all to their resources. And then the um, Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, which, you know, I, I'm in Canada doing this presentation, so I had to learn a little bit about uh, the background here. Um, I know that COPA is part of the language, but it's not explicitly uh, followed the same way it is in other places. So um, the big thing with COPA is 13 or under need that parental consent. So if you are working with students under the age of 13 and they have to have a login and password, researching where to get those things and how to connect with parents to make it as obvious as you can is your best bet. The other thing that our school's policy wanted me to do was read the terms of service. If you've never read terms of service, mm -hmm. it is daunting. Pretty much they asked me in the next form, which this is what I had to answer to get approval. <laughs> so if you are in a school system where it's a little more um, open-ended, but you want to make sure you cover yourself, the big things that I need to make sure that I had a good answer for were what type of student information does a social media request to be posted. So if kids are using it and posting, what is it that the social media platform takes? Username, age, location, and it's really reading that through. Uh, fortunately, since I'm the only one posting and my colleagues are, I was able to answer that. It uses my school address, uses my age, my location, not the kids. So that was fortunate, but if it was Pinterest, I, I would have to fill that all out and get parental consent for kids under age, age of the age of 13. Um, the next thing was really demonstrating the use. So is it appropriate for the students' ages? Which I know it's kind of a, a little reductive question. Like, of course I'm going to choose something that's appropriate for their ages. But what I started to realize was hashtagging things and getting that, um, that following. I could be held responsible if a kid touched a hashtag and it led them somewhere else, but they did it through my account. Mm -hmm. So if I did hashtag drawing and they clicked on that from my Instagram page and then that took them to nude life drawing and their parents had an issue with that, I could be held accountable for that progression. So at the moment I cannot hashtag or, or um, search, be able to search for anything or connect in that way. I'm trying to, to work on that as well but you know. I started off with a no when I first filled out this form, flat out no for my Instagram page. Then getting the chance to go back, I put a little more regulation on it, and we're still testing it out between what the central office says I can do and what I feel comfortable doing. Yeah? I was just going to say, like, <clears throat> there's this idea of responsibility and trust and I guess, because I had that happen too, where I was, was like one click away or one, some ad pops up and I, you know, there's stuff you can, some of that stuff you can't, I found I couldn't control very well. So I was always worried about that. I never was explicitly told what you were told. But I guess I'm like, I was kind of thinking like, kids have to figure out what are you clicking, right? Like, have some responsibility over where you're going on here. It's not just me, yeah. but I, I, that was a hard, like, 
I guess we didn't cover that enough. But to me, I was also very much of the you learn by doing, sure. but mistakes seem costly in this venue, right? Whereas everyone makes a mistake, but it feels like you make a mistake online, like, Phew. yeah. So, so I'm curious how you, if you had mistakes happen, or how, how do you have, because those are learning, to me that's learning, mm -hmm. but it's tricky learning because there's so much invested around any slip ups that happen. Yeah, and that's what, filling out this form was tedious to begin with. Um, and it's, it's linked to, to my presentation, so if you want to go a little more specific, I mean it was like 20 questions deep about what information were they pulling, did you read the terms of service, do you understand the terms of service? And one of the things, mistake-wise, yeah, I made them. But fortunately, our, the IT person at our, in our district and I were able to have a conversation back and forth. And so giving him the access that I had and all the information that I had allowed him to go through and really search into that with a different lens. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a parent in our district yet either, and he is, of one of the kids that I have in class. Mm -hmm. So he is able to approach it with, okay, the lawyers tell us this thing behind the scenes, me as a parent feel this way. So we were able to fortunately have a great conversation back and forth but it took me um, two tries of this mm -hmm. and a one-on-one -on -one meeting face-to-face -face and showing my personal one to say like, this is my intention. And that was the next thing I was gonna have you guys think about is, if you want to share artwork, work in progress, poetry, written work, um, student work, I'm gonna give you some guidelines, mm -hmm. but the real thought is, who is the audience? Mm -hmm. So in thinking about that, I really had to think about, is this for the students, or am I sharing for others their work? And that's what my intention was, mm -hmm. was, you know, grandma in Florida, who won't make it up for the art show in the spring, or someone in another country, mm -hmm. or teachers that I know from other places. Mm -hmm. That was my goal, was to connect with those people about what my kids are doing in a great way to help them build the confidence that their work is worth it. Mm -hmm. So it's figuring out who your audience is, and if that's the case, students can see the work the way I've done it, parents are following us, grandparents are following us, other educators are following us. If you would like to as well, it's, mm -hmm. those are the two of them that I have up on the board. You're more than welcome to follow either one. Um, and I'll show you kind of what it looks like. But, I didn't start off with Instagram. A great way to start is creating a Skype and doing a Skype, because that's a one-to-one -one face voice call with other creative people. So the other night, this was actually just earlier this month, um, we went to Casco Bay Artisans in Portland, Maine right on the water, beautiful gallery if you ever get to Portland, Maine. And they have a lot of contemporary work, a lot of other work, but um, one of the events they wanted to host was Jeff Rowland, who is an artist, and he's in southern France, rural France. He actually Skyped in to have a conversation with us as we all sat around, you know, with a little computer screen projected up, and we talked back and forth with the artist himself, talking about his work directly. So a great thing that I think would be an easy way to kind of monitor that conversation would be to use Skype and connect with another professional in a good, healthy, consistent way. Because most of the time when you're going to connect with another artist, another professional, another teacher, they have the same thought that you do. That it's, okay, we're not going to do any inappropriate content. We're not going to speak poorly. And it gives you that, that chance to kind of get the ball rolling in the right direction. So Skype is a great way that you can set up an account. It's your personal or private account or your professional account that the kids don't have to be a part of other than being an active participant. You also don't have to show their images with the person as well. It could just be voices and, and a voice call. So that's one way that you can start. Another way that's a little more disconnected but still kind of relates to uh, getting the kids work online, is I have two different ways that I kind of
kind of monitor and, and not monitor, I'm sorry, share work online and I can monitor them behind the scenes is on just a, a Wix web page. This is all student work on a Wix web page. It, it's under my professional website, but people can go on and click. There's no liking, it's just an image, an image database. They can click on the image, it blows it up nice full screen, gets a good clear image of, of the artwork. There's no connection to names. These are not my work, they are kids' work. But I do have permission from the kids to share it. I made sure that I got that from them, like I would any other professional. So I had them sit down, they sign the paperwork, their parents sign the paperwork. And this is actually part of my professional resume when I go and interview for other places. Because you know, I can share as much of my own artwork as I want, but a principal wants to see what I do with kids, not necessarily what I do on my own. And then down here is just a simple blog that I will guarantee almost every district has a web-based somewhere, web-based page or system somewhere. And this was a very simple, easy way to just add on to that and dump images in. The problem that I have with these is you have to search for them. They normally have these URLs that are really long, very tedious with a lot of stuff. They're not applications that you as, as adults flip through or kids will go to unless they know it's there. So this was the original go-between that my IT director wanted me to do. I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. It was a lot more work than I wanted. I wanted to do something on my phone, easily put it up, share, and have it done. This was a little too much clicking for my liking. Plus, I couldn't put a little blurb about what it was, or what we were doing, or what they're watching. And there were only still images. I couldn't really share a video. So, <clears throat> one of the things that I did notice, our school had Twitter. I was like, oh, I can just use the Twitter account. The, the vice principal runs this, our assistant principal. So I'm like, oh, I can just send her all the, the information, and she can post it for me. But that's giving the job to someone else and adding to their day. And she's like, oh, I'll just give the login and stuff. And I was like, okay. But what I notice is Twitter is really more for language, for words, for writing. The image quality isn't great. Um, and it's not really where creative people share their own personal work. So I decided to do Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I finally got it all approved. I walked through a lot of steps. It took about, I would say, 20 emails, three face-to-face -face conversations, a lot of smiling, a lot of reassuring, a lot of um, practice to get to where we are. And what it looks like <clears throat> what it looks like is this. When you click on an image, it takes you right to the image. Some of them I post content with, some of them I post language with, some of them I just don't, because it's running in between. Um, your, the phone allows you to do a lot of the work itself. These were just taken right as the kids finished them. I put them on the table, photographed them, cropped them right on my phone, uploaded them to Instagram, no filter necessary, hashtag no filter. Um, but what I did was a very simple blurb, mm -hmm. and I can turn off commenting. Mm -hmm. It's one click. I can share it, and I can also go between my two accounts. So if you've ever used Instagram multiple accounts, it's super easy to get to your professional and your personal account and swap them back and forth. You just go right, and I can walk you guys all through that. If you click on your likes, does it show you who liked it? It does. That now, was, uh, did they like that or? This is okay, okay, but I do have to monitor for spam. Yes, I found I had to constantly get yeah. the. So I do monitor for spam, um, and much like Canada, Maine has legal cannabis. So one of the people that keeps following me is Maine 420, oh. and I'm like, oh, oh block, yes, block. block. Right. So once I block them, and it may be even apparent, I don't know. But I'm also, it's, 
it's not something that a 12 year old needs mm -hmm. in their life at the moment. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. And you know, I would rather err on the side of safety mm -hmm. than have to worry about that is, is where I get hung up and mm -hmm. I get in trouble for. Um, I also turned off any commenting mm -hmm. so they can't comment. And as far as messaging is concerned, we set it up in a way that in, this, in the preferences, the only messages I can receive are from people that I follow. Mm -hmm. Well, do you follow anybody? I'm following no one. Yeah. And I make that clear to the kids. In our weekly email, the MSK Fine Arts goes out, the Instagram account goes out. About every post, I probably get anywhere from two to three kids that follow, and about one to three parents that follow along. The parents are really love to see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So on Friday or Thursday, before I came all the way up here, we took the kids to uh, the Museum of Fine Art in Boston. And here's how I get around images. This image on my phone, here are my kids. Here are more of the kids from our school. The docent, I took it from the back of the group. Mm -hmm. No faces. This actually, the full image has his last name on his shirt. So I just cropped it enough to get him in the image, but not his shirt. Mm -hmm. And that's a way that I get around um, those, those issues. Mm -hmm. I don't tag any kids, use any names, mm -hmm. um, and I make sure that that's all really taken care of. And part of our system does tell me what kids have media releases and, what, and who don't. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to quickly look that information up. What I also do is this. Right. With process photos, I photograph hands at work. Unless they've got really recognizable hands, yeah. I'm in good shape. So what I would like to do is to just use the rest of the about 10, 15 minutes of time, allow you to practice, oh, 10 minutes of time, allow you to practice photographing. I brought one of my little tiny pieces because it fit in my bag on the plane. Um, we did get bored. We finally found bored from our fourth art store in Toronto. I couldn't find gray anywhere. Plenty of white and black, but no gray. Um, so if you wanted to photograph, I can show you how to use your phone to photograph in a really great way. And then if you would like to investigate either my accounts or possibly look through and read the terms of service, I would love to coach you through how to get an online account started with you and your students. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for letting me share my story, and I'm here for any help. Thank you so much. Can, can I just say, I mean, if I were a student in your art class and my teacher were doing this and elevating my work in this platform and elevating my work for an audience, an authentic audience, mm -hmm. beyond just the eyes of the teacher, I think it says a lot about how you value their voice and their, their art. So, thank oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and um, there are some moments I had a beautiful email come from one of my other students, uh, a direct message from one of my students before all this happened, thanking me for those things. And it was a little heartbreaking to, to write back, this account does not receive direct messages, please email. <laughs> you know, that was like, oh. They come from you. <laughs> yeah, so I did get a chance to say thank you for her comment, but it was through my professional email setting. But I appreciate that. Thanks. Um, and I'm, you know, it's just sharing the kids' work. Uh, we've got little, I think, yeah, little videos of them doing the work in the classroom, and they love it. Mm -hmm. If I come around with my phone, it's got music playing on my speaker. And I'm kind of just going around, and then it's like, ooh, are you going to take a picture of me? Is it going to be mine? And now I'm trying to figure out how to make it an equitable practice. So when I learn tips and tricks for that, I'll, I'll share it with you. Because I don't want to show the same kids thing every time. I have a kindergarten trick for you. Oh. On your, you can do your class list, mm -hmm. like on Poetly, even for out a week, and then mark them out and say, this week I'm focusing on you know, Brandon, <clears throat> da, 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 these five kids, and then by the end of the month, you've cycled through your whole class list. Can you help kind of 
That's it. Like they do in the kindergarten class between the teacher and the ECE yeah. for documentation and share it. And if you have five kids to worry about, it, it's easier than thinking about 30. And then matching up some of the kids that are, you know, ones that are always getting attention with some that are not getting attention, or maybe ones that are need a little bit more, a little more um, incentive for behavior. Would be a great way to do it. Thank you. Uh, so, I found Instagram being a great way with kids. Um, you know. It, with self-portraits in eighth grade, how difficult that is to look at yourself in a mirror. Mm -hmm. And they loved the fact that I went on and shared the things in progress. Mm -hmm. They thought it was really cool. Um, so I hope it turns into that confidence building. Um, turning off the commenting, and it's only a like thing, but I'm also trying to, to get kids to understand that they're not defined by likes. That's what I was just going to ask you was whether they go, oh, I don't like this But yeah. I think what they're really looking for is like what you just said, an authentic audience, because art is communication. So why are they just doing it for you? You know what I mean? They have this structure in education where you do this for the teacher, but you're teaching them how to do this for, to share, right? It's, just, it's communication, it's just visual communication. So. And it was really cool the other day, I had posted, I believe, this one. So, was it this class? No, it was not. I know exactly which one it was. It was this class. So, these were my sixth graders, and they were so loud, so loud. And my room is very echoey. And I sat back and I was like, it was like lunchtime with all of you, all 200 of you, but only 12 of you in the space. They just, you know, they get excited and shout over each other. So even though I had to kind of manage that behavior of putting them in the science seats for the next class, I shared their artwork, and they loved the fact that their artwork was online. They totally overlooked the fact that they had a science seat for the day. Mm -hmm. They were so interested and, and proud that their artwork was on the page more than they were upset with me that I put them in the seats. So I consider it a win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's those little victories. What do you think is the resistance? Because <clears throat> we see how awesome this is. Mm -hmm. And now you're able to say, like, look. And the kids are saying, like, we love, you know, we like this. What, where, what is this nexus of resistance that we keep coming up against? What is the fear? I feel like we keep coming up against this technical fear in education, and I, you just did battle in a way with it to kind of be like reassurance. What were you reassuring? Like, what was the heart at the heart of that mistrust? So I can only speak in a in a personal way. Yes. And my personal story. Um, I am working in a system where we were just in the news and in court for someone that used um, a personal account to interact and, and use that interface with a student. So that was the biggest thing that I had to make sure. I had to make sure that there was no communication that wasn't uh, something that was tracked, that couldn't be seen, that was private. So I had to make sure that that was clearly laid out, that I had a plan for all of that communication, and that I kept the kids identity is safe. Those were the two big things. And um, I felt like I was saying, we have the same intent. Just let me try. And that's what it finally came down to, is I, I said, let me try. The worst that'll happen is we say no. But giving them the access and the, the um, username and passwords, if it was to the Twitter, to the Google Slides and the Google Share parts, to the website and to the Instagram page, it made it a lot easier. So it was like, go and look. Transparency, and look yeah. Yep. You, you aligned your intent with your impact, mm -hmm. and you made yourself transparent, and you went through all of the kind of logistical hoops, and I think that that's a winning combination for you as an educator. 
in, in the process, that's not how I thought about it. There was a lot of conversation between Nick and I at home and, and troubleshooting. Like, I meet with so-and-so tomorrow, what do I say? How do I go through it? So we role-played the conversation, and I didn't think of it that way. Um, but it's funny, because something that's kid-focused took like three or four educators to kind of answer all the questions about and cycle back around. So hopefully my experience in sharing that will help mm -hmm. you in whatever your experience is, that you don't have the month of those conversations like I did, that you can just jump right to the end. Mm -hmm. Because the point is student work, sharing it, mm -hmm. being authentic, being real. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I wanted. And to get amazing work that our students do, to be part of that process. Mm -hmm. So kind of to, to end things off, um, the biggest thing that I would say is figure out your audience, your intent, mm -hmm. and how to get there, and then whatever platform you're comfortable with starting. It may not be where you end, but it's a great place to start just to use it. 